Dr. Yun over in Santa Monica at the Center for Hip and Knee Replacement. And today we're going to go over our rationale for two stage versus one stage removal of hardware in patients with prior knee surgery, post traumatic arthritis when they are preparing for total knee replacement. We'll take you through our treatment algorithm. And this is Tori. <laughs> so every post traumatic knee is different. Every post traumatic knee is different. And there are many types of hardware used, and we're going to use this knee as our case study. So this is a, a younger gentleman. He's previously had his other knee replaced 10 years ago. Uh, he sustained this tibial plateau fracture. He underwent open reduction in internal fixation through a lot of exposure. This is a fixed angle plate, and he has over a dozen screws in this area. And then the question is, how do we manage this hardware? This hardware will clearly impinge, so it has to be, it will impinge with the planned tibial component, so it clearly has to be removed. And the question is, how will we manage it? How will we do our CT scan and our studies? And then how will we approach the soft tissues in this knee replacement? So we'll take you a little bit through our thought process and how this is done. But backing up, as I said before, each post-traumatic knee is a little bit different. So this is a trauma associated with a tibial plateau fracture. This is a trauma associated with an ACL rupture. They both have retained hardware, but the type of retained hardware, the volume of retained hardware, and the soft tissues related to that retained hardware are completely different. And so we try to separate different types of knees based on different criteria. One criteria is the volume of hardware. So this patient has two screws and an endo button. There's a tibial screw and a femoral screw and an endo button, and there are washers around each screw. But this is very different. This is a plate with multiple fixed angle screws that go across the joint and grow di go diagonally from distal to proximal into the joint. So the first consideration is the volume and the type of the volume of hardware. The second is the type of hardware. So these are isolated screws. But this is a screw and a plate. These are very different. This can often be removed. These can often be removed percutaneously. This requires an extensile incision to remove. The third is the possibility of impingement. Will the hardware in place block the placement of the knee replacement going in? This will clearly block the tibial component. These unlikely because they're distal or they're far away from the end of the tibia, but these will clearly block. This one will get in the way. This one will not get in the way. This little endo button will not get in the way. So the third component, third consideration is impingement of hardware. And then the fourth is accessibility. So, so typically for a knee replacement, we go through a midline incision, but this has a lateral incision in the area where the plate was fixed. So there's a separate incision here. So it will need to be exposed through a separate area. You just can't get to it from a midline incision. This will be visible from the midline incision as we open up the medial soft tissue sleeve. This was placed through a second incision and will not be able to be accessed easily through a standard total knee replacement incision. So management of the soft tissue is also an important consideration. So number one is the volume of hardware, this versus something like this, the type of hardware plates versus screws and washers and buttons. Third, potential impingement, blocking, blocking, not blocking, and Fourth, the accessibility of the hardware, how we can access it through the soft tissue window or through the existing incision. And so while the majority of time we'll do everything in a one stage approach, we'll deal with the hardware at the time of the knee replacement. Occasionally we'll come across a situation like this, and this is typically the setting of a post-traumatic arthritis with either a distal femoral fracture or a tibial plateau fracture fixed with open reduction and internal fixation plates and screws. So we're not just removing one or two screws through a small percutaneous incision. Uh, there's a large plate, there are dozens of screws, and we're not just working in this area. We have to come all the way down here because some of the screws have been placed in a diagonal fashion from distal all the way to proximal. So we'll have to go all the way down here in order to gain access. And again, it's not just in one plane. This is an L-shaped plate, and so it's in multiple planes. These screws are in multiple planes. So because of this, we will often do this as a two-stage procedure. Number one, so that there's going to be a, a lateral incision, so this lateral incision has time to heal. Number two, so that we can remove this entire construct. And number three, so that at the end, we will have a more normal appearing knee. 
This is important when we use a robotically assisted surgery so that we'll be able to get a CT that is not corrupted or loses detail because of the artifact from all these screws. So we'll get a much more accurate CT working with an otherwise normal appearing knee. So again, we can see the arthritic change, the tricuspid disease, the varus deformity, the lateral subluxation, um, but we'll be able to get a much more accurate reading without the presence of all this hardware. Without the hardware in place, then we can make a very clear three-dimensional model where we have a very crisp outline of the femur and the coronal, the axial, and the sagittal planes, as is the tibia. Now we can still see the scarring. You can see this is the area where the screws are. This is the area where the screws are. But instead of having an artifact, we can very clearly see the area of the bone. And here's another scar. We can see this, this screw would have blocked this, this base plate. And these screws would have blocked the keel. And so in the absence of these screws, we can get a very clear understanding of the anatomy of the bone and optimally where we want to position our femur and where we want to position our tibia. And then once we planned out our knee, we've done our appropriate releases. Remember, we started with a varus knee that was laterally subluxed. We can recreate the symmetry and extension gaps and go back to our normal plan. Again, this is the evolution. So this is the post-traumatic arthritis with the varus and the lateral subluxation and the retained hardware. There was a long lateral incision. So we went in with the first procedure and then took this out and then allowed it to close in the interval. Then we got an, a CT scan off of this so that we were able to make a three-dimensional model without the presence of artifact from metal. So a very clear plan. And then this is our post-operative x-ray back into neutral alignment with a symmetric extension gap. The need for two stage versus one stage will always be dependent on the volume of hardware, the type of hardware, the potential for impingement, and the accessibility of the hardware. And again, every knee is different, but for most situations of ligament rupture or soft tissue disruption, ACL or MCL repairs, we'll be able to do those through a one stage exchange just because the volume of hardware is substantially less. But for patients who have had a major fracture around the knee, a periarticular fracture, and they have either a distal femoral, a, a, a distal femoral plate or a proximal femoral plate, we'll often need to do those in two stage. Thank you very much.